Most people share some sort of common understanding about what angels are, but a really important question to ask is, is that understanding even accurate? If you know anything about angels, this is probably the story that you know. It was a quiet night in Nazareth. A young girl named Mary was tending to her chores when suddenly an angel named Gabriel appeared before her. He said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Do not be afraid. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The cultural understanding of these things is like these winged figures, they're serene, they are nice. But there's this little interesting clue at the beginning of that story where Gabriel says to Mary, do not be afraid. This is the first kind of hint of understanding of what these things might actually be. And angels have become this kind of ancillary note in terms of, of how we understand the Bible, but, but it's incorrect. It's actually closer to like a Rosetta Stone that kind of helps us unlock everything that happens before Jesus. So let's get into it. I want to start by talking about the word angel because it's kind of actually a misnomer. The word angel for us just is this all-encompassing term that is everything that is a winged figure that kind of works for God. But that's not actually how it's typically understood in the Bible or just even in ancient Christianity. So the, the Hebrew word for angel is Elohim. But what's interesting is the same word is used for God. So Elohim is the word for God and Elohim is the word for angel. But it what it actually describes is something that is a spiritual divine being. It's this kind of all-encompassing term for all things spiritual. So the important thing to know about the word Elohim is that they're distinct from us. They're separate. We're physical, but these are purely spiritual things. So when they were translating the Bible, the thing that allowed them to kind of distinct between Elohim God and Elohim angel is the way that they use the verb. So like an interesting English example would be how we differentiate between sheep. The sheep is climbing up the hill, points to singular sheep, or the sheep are climbing up the hill would be plural sheep. So the same thing would be true of angels and God. So that's how they differentiate. Elohim is would be God. Elohim are would be angel. There's this interesting verse, Psalms 82.1, and I'll add in the Elohim so you can kind of see it. So the verse would be, God presides in the great assembly. He renders judgment among the gods. So the traditional understanding would be Elohim presides amongst the assembly. He renders judgments amongst the Elohim. But you can tell who is who because Elohim is, Elohim renders, versus amongst the Elohim, plural. So there's kind of a distinction between Elohim and Elohim, which is be God and the angels. So that's how they differentiate between the angels. Most of the Elohim in the Bible is referring to God, but you'll see these subtle distinctions where they're talking about angels specifically. So even going back to that verse, God renders his judgment amongst the gods, and that's in Psalms 82.1. But that points to something really fascinating about angels that's often overlooked, that God renders his judgment amongst the Elohim. It's pointing to the idea that God speaks to a council that is how he kind of distributes justice. We think of it as this kind of kingship, and it is because they're all in service of him, but he seems to work within this divine council of order, and he consults with these things that he's made, these, these Elohim. And that's really important because it, it kind of changes our understanding of all the thing that com comes after that, right? So these angels aren't just these kind of ancillary characters that will show up to tell Mary about the birth of Jesus. They, they seem to be very important to God, and they, they point us to how he actually rules in his kingdom. We aren't sure, or at least the Bible doesn't tell us why God actually rules within a divine council, but it seems that he does. So we have to kind of take that understanding and then extrapolate meaning from that understanding. So the important thing to understand is first that it distinguishes between God and angels, 
But even just the word Elohim, it just means divine beings. It's not like a specific classification, right? So you would think about it as like the word mammal. Just because you say mammal, you don't know if you're talking about a dog or a cat. There's all these different kind of subspecies under the umbrella of mammal. Elohim works in the same way. So the, the first thing that we can do to kind of understand this is dive a little bit more into divine counsel, our understanding of it, and then we can get a little bit more into the, each individual species that fall under the classification of Elohim. High above the earth, in a realm unseen by human eyes, there lies a throne room of unimaginable majesty. The air hums with the power of countless celestial beings, each one standing at attention, their forms glowing with divine light. At the center of this assembly sits the Almighty, His presence radiating authority and wisdom. This is the Divine Council, where the fate of nations and the course of history are decided. On this particular day, the Council is gathered to discuss the fate of a rebellious king. The prophet Micaiah, granted a rare glimpse into this sacred chamber, later recounts what he witnessed. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne with all the multitudes of heaven, standing around him on his right and on his left. And the Lord said, Who will entice Ahab into attacking Ramoth Gilead and going to his death there? One suggested this and another that. Finally, a spirit came forward, stood before the Lord and said, I will entice him. By what means? the Lord asked. I will go out and be a deceiving spirit in the mouths of all his prophets. You will succeed in enticing him, said the Lord. Go and do it. This scene is strange. It is something that you would not hear in church. It's actually from uh, Kings. But what's really interesting about this is it's a it's a pretty clear example of how God is sitting in kind of at a you know an office room with his angels and they're discussing how to carry out his will. How are they going to get this rebellious king to fall? How are they going to get him to follow God's plan? You know they're they're discussing different ideas. Certain angels are saying this. Certain angels are saying that. And they're kind of discussing it. And it's this weird thing that we typically would never study in church, but the important thing to really understand is that the divine council or, you know, any of these different celestial hierarchies that we'll get into a little bit later, it's not some sort of symbolic thing. It's actually really important in terms of how God rules his kingdom. It's this weird thing that is overlooked in church, but it's actually super important in terms of our day-to-day -day lives, in terms of how God's plan is put here on earth. One of the ways that you'll see these beings referred to in the Bible is they call them the sons of God. Um, and that's, that's a, something that you'll see a few different places in the Bible. And it's one of these kind of council of angels that God typically refers to. So I want to get a little bit more into that and help you understand the origin of the sons of God. They have kind of a, a sordid history and, then, and what that term means a little bit more in terms of the functionality of, of God's authority and kingdom. The story of the sons of God really brings us to one of the strangest verses in the Bible. It's one of the first verses in the Bible. And if you ask people about it, they almost never understand it or they they don't even typically know that it exists because it's so strange when you read it just as a standalone thing that they're like, they, they don't, they won't believe that it's there because it's like, that feels so foreign to what we think of as the Bible because they just, Pastors will just skip it because it's so odd. The verse actually comes from Genesis 6, and I'll just read it here for you. The sons of God saw that the daughters of humans were beautiful, and they married any of them that they chose. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterwards, when the sons of gods went into the daughter of humans and had children by them, they were the heroes of old, the men of renown. I want to take a second just to get into the details of this. The sons of God saw that the daughters of humans were beautiful. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days. And the sons of God had sex with the daughters of humans and had children by them. They were the heroes of old, the men of renown. Odd. Just to 
push this a little bit further and kind of set up what comes next. Here's a little story and backstory about these sons of God, also called the Watchers. Long before the floodwaters covered the earth, a group of angels known as the Watchers descended from the heavens. These beings, referred to as the sons of God in the Bible, were sent to guide and watch over humanity, ensuring that God's will was followed on earth. But instead of fulfilling their divine purpose, they were captivated by the beauty of human women. In their desire, they made a choice that would lead to a catastrophic rebellion against God, forever altering the course of human history. So as these beings are referred to in Genesis 6, they're called the sons of God. They're later called the watchers. And there's, there's some reasons that we'll get into as to why they're called that. They find these human women beautiful and they take them as wives and they have children by them. And these children are called Nephilim. You might be familiar with Nephilim from the story of David and Goliath. Goliath was at least part Nephilim. Um, he was likely whole Nephilim. But these things are described as giants with red hair and very fierce, very scary. And they kind of ruled the land with an iron fist. They would do all sorts of evil things according to the lore. But it's an odd verse. It's an odd verse to kind of open Genesis. It's pretty early on in Genesis. And what we know is that these sons of God, these watchers, were Elohim. They were angels. Um, they were an angel with a specific designation and role. But these angels were sent to earth to watch over the land. These Elohim were put all over the earth and they were told to watch over these people to take care of them. But they go against God and they start intermarrying, having sex with these humans, and they birth these children called the Nephilim that end up becoming these giants and they were the men of renown. So there's all this lore that these men of renown may have been these people that we refer to in Greek myths and these, you know, Gilgamesh, Hercules, all these different characters that we now are very familiar with, but it's, it's an odd history. And, and even more strangely, the, the idea that giants once walked the earth is a almost a universal myth, you know, and not to say that this is a myth, but, but to understand it as that it's in Greek mythology, it's in Egyptian mythology, the Aztecs, the Mayans, all of these people around the world shared this idea of these giants, these fierce giants that were evil and they ruled over them and they had all of these kind of special powers in a certain way. So the first time that we hear about the Watchers in the story of the Bible is in Genesis, but there's actually an older story from the Book of Enoch. The Book of Enoch was this book that was well understood by the people who wrote the Bible it's referenced by Paul, it's referenced by Jude, it's referenced by Peter. I think you can make a pretty convincing case that Jesus had an extremely high working knowledge of the book of Enoch. From everything we know, it, it was it, at the very least historically accurate. And in my opinion, I think it should have been canonical um, for a lot of different reasons. It's found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. But anyway, the, the Watchers, that was their first appearance in the Book of Enoch. The Book of Enoch is actually the story of Noah's great-grandfather. So you have Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, Noah. And it's the story of Enoch, who is the scribe to God here on earth. And he's kind of the intercessory between the Watchers, who God has put in charge of this land, and God. He's writing down the things that need to be said, and he's kind of proclaiming them to the people, to the watchers, or however, you know, it, it, it worked out. These watchers decide to betray God, um, and they had sex with the women, and they birthed these Nephilim, but they also did things like taught humans about astrology, which is why uh, most Christian faiths ban astrology. They taught them about how to make weapons. They taught women how to use makeup. So they were teaching all these things outside of God's plan. God get, gets very angry and he decides he's going to flood the earth. And Genesis, or at least the story of Noah, picks up where Enoch stops. The book of Enoch ends with the watchers in their divine punishment from God. And that's where we meet the other Elohim first time. So you're introduced to, to your first separate species of angel. And this is an angel that you would be familiar with. So you meet the Malachim, which would be the archangels. So God tells Michael and Raphael and Uriel, all these different angels that you're familiar with, that 
we need to punish the watchers. He chains them to the center of the earth, hell, and they walk Enoch through hell and he gets a, a vision of, of what is to come and God's plan for the, the new covenant that is going to be started with his great grandson, Noah, which is fascinating. But the important thing to, to understand here and that what you can see hints of in Genesis, but you see it in Enoch and you see it repeated throughout the rest of the Bible is that there are different types of Elohim. So we've met the watchers, the sons of God, and we've met the Malachim, the archangels. So there seems to be different types of Elohim that work in service to God. They are similar to us. They have some sort of human qualities, or at least they can in some instances. But they also seem to have free will. They can betray God. They can make their own decisions. But they're always um, under the authority of God because God punishes them. Um, so they, they acted independently. But the thing to take away is that this is kind of like a little clue as to what comes next, that there are more angels or types of angels operating in the world than what we would typically understand or we would typically see without going into to the nitty gritty like this to understand kind of the different structuring of angels heaven is structured as a hierarchy and there's all different reasons for that but to understand these different species of angels and how they interact and work with each other um, we have to look a little bit more into the celestial hierarchy and this is something that's kind of been developed from everything that we know about angels in the bible and how they interact with each other our interactions with them how we see them and it's different um, theologians and mystics that have kind of worked through the details of this and we have now a, a pretty clear understanding of where these angels sit what their roles are and what they are like what their relationship is to us In the time before time, before there were stars and galaxies, the universe was a living tapestry where every element was connected in perfect divine harmony. The cosmos pulsed with an unseen rhythm, each part influencing the whole. This delicate balance was the foundation of all creation, ensuring that every force and power worked in unison. It was in this vast, interconnected realm that the divine order was upheld. A cosmic hierarchy, where everything had its place and purpose, guided by Yahweh. So what are these divine forces, these kind of structured layers that we just heard about in the story? It's called the celestial hierarchy. So this idea starts by this guy named uh, Dionysus of Areopagite. And then it's further kind of nailed down and get into the nitty gritty later by Thomas Aquinas in the 13th century. So who is Dionysus of Areopagite? He is actually a convert of Paul. They talk about him specifically in the book of Acts. Paul names him as one of his converts and he writes under the name the Areopagite. He is now referred to as Pseudo Dionysus because his work was popularized in the Middle Ages and they were unsure of the authorship. But there's pretty good evidence that the guy was real. Paul wrote about him and these writings are least trustworthy. And so he's kind of this mystic guy he understands and he's looking at the writings of Ezekiel. He's looking at John and revelations and all these kind of smaller interactions that these people have with angels. And they kind of work out a structure for how these things operate and their different roles within the kingdom. And there's this kind of hierarchical structure based off of their jobs that they will interact with humans, their roles are in our day-to-day -day lives, which is just a fascinating idea. Going through the different celestial hierarchies, we have the first triad, which would be the seraphim, the throne or wheel angels, if you've heard wheel angels, and then you have the cherubim. These are the angels that are closest to God. They're, they can be within his divine realm and they can, um, they're pure enough to be closer to God. And each of these things, each of these different types of angels have these kind of different features about them that we'll get into a little bit later that are really fascinating, but it kind of functions to their role in the hierarchy, the seraphim sitting closest to God, which we'll get into. But there's these different kind of roles that these angels will uh, fulfill based off of their physical form, but also their role in God's kingdom. The next level in the celestial hierarchy is the angels that are responsible for 
governing the cosmos. It's the balance between good and evil. They're almost this managerial class that handle the 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 day to day of the large picture of good and evil and God's plan here on earth. So you have the dominions, the virtues, and the powers. Those are the three designations of the Elohim or angels that sit amongst the second triad. These are kind of the the day to day workers of God's kingdom. These are people kind of deciding what happens and and where things go on a on a cosmic level. The dominions are specifically over the day-to-day actions of other angels on earth. So they're kind of these administrative angels over angels. So they kind of handle the um, the actions of angels, making sure that everybody's kind of operating correctly in, in terms of God's plan for the earth, which we know that the angels have free will. So they kind of need some managerial structures to keep them in line that they're operating correctly um, in, in terms of what God wants to happen um, on earth, but also within the ranks of his his workers. Next level of angels, the virtues, they are responsible for blessings, for um, divine mercies. So they, they bestow the goodwill of God and they make sure that everything's in balance. But their primary role is that of mercy and blessings um, and the, the good virtues that, that people aspire to here on earth. And then finally, you have the powers, and these are kind of the, the law enforcement arms. So they are the defenders of uh, the spiritual realm. They're defenders of making sure that the evil is kept at bay on earth, and they, they work to protect God's plan um, in a very forceful, powerful kind of soldier, cop kind of way. They are the enforcers of, of every all the other layers that have come before them, that, that they enforce the law. They don't just measure it or, or, or keep an eye on it. They are the enforcers of, of these things. Then you have the final triad, the, the third triad, so the third third group that is the most furthest away from God in terms of its physical location. But these would be the angels that you are familiar with. These are the angels and the archangels. So they would be called the Malachim, the archangels, and then the Malach would be the messenger angels. That's what the word messenger means, right? So you're kind of getting into the idea that these angels are named according to their job title and purpose. So the the word angel is derived from the Greek word angelos, Los Angeles, but that is a translation of the Hebrew word malach, which means messenger. So the angels that you see, you know, talking to Abraham, these are all just different messenger angels or the ones that talk to Mary. These are, these are angels whose primary role is to be the messenger. They're delivering messages for God and they're interacting with us on a real human scale. So the thing to really take away from the understanding of the celestial hierarchy is that we now look at the Bible and we just see angels, but that's not really accurate. So you have Elohim, that's that's the more accurate word. And under that, there's this hierarchy of all these, not only just angels with different functions and different job titles, but different almost species. They look different, they act different. And so I will turn briefly to the top of the hierarchy. There's that first triad of the, the seraphim, the wheel angels, and the cherubim. In the ancient temple, the prophet Isaiah was suddenly transported to a vision of the heavenly realm. He stood in awe as he beheld the throne of God, towering in majesty, surrounded by beings of unimaginable splendor. These were the seraphim, the exalted ones, whose very presence radiated with the fire of divine love. Each seraph had six wings, two that covered their faces, shielding themselves from the direct gaze of God's glory two that covered their feet in a gesture of deep humility, and two that allowed them to hover in constant reverent worship. The air around them was charged with their powerful chant, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. Their voices were so powerful that the very foundations of the temple shook, and a dense smoke filled the air, symbolizing the overwhelming presence of the divine. So if you remember, among the celestial hierarchy, the seraphim are the closest to God. They sit at the throne of God. And 
they are personally my favorite angel. I, I find them totally fascinating. So they're described as having six wings. So they have two that cover the face, two that cover the feet, and then they have two to fly. But what's interesting about these angels is their entire role is just to worship. That's all they do. And if you're, you're Catholic, you would be familiar with their chant, holy, 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 which they said in every single mass. But the role of these angels is to fly around the throne of God and they worship him and they can't take their eyes from him. They don't, they don't want to show their face in reverence. So they have the wings that cover their face, but they keep their face turned towards God. And they're often referred to as the fiery ones. Um, maybe that's because of their appearance, but it's more than likely that there is, there's a purity to them that allows them to sit so close to, to God that, that their love and their understanding of the divine is so strong that they appear fiery or that their presence is fiery in some way that maybe we don't understand. But they sit around the throne of God, and you'll see this in paintings, and they, they just watch God and they say, holy, holy, holy. It's, it's, it's a complete act of worship. So beyond the, the, the physical understanding of what these angels do, that their role is to worship, it's also kind of a, an interesting, instructive um, symbol for what is needed to approach the throne of God. And then the story of Isaiah, which you just heard, he, I believe he has to get a coal put on his mouth. There's a purification process that has to be ordered by God before you're even allowed into this area to see this area that you have to, you have to have everything burned off of you. You have to have all that's impure burned off before you can approach the throne of God. They, however, aren't the only ones that kind of protect the throne of God, the next set of angels would be the cherubim. When Adam and Eve took their final steps out of Eden, the garden's entrance was sealed behind them. But this was no ordinary closure. As they departed, fierce beings known as cherubim appeared, embodying the full power and majesty of creation. With four faces, a human, a lion, an ox, and an eagle, they stood as eternal guardians. At their command was a flaming sword, flashing back and forth, ensuring that the sanctity of Eden was preserved. The way to the Tree of Life was now fiercely protected, marking the boundary between the sacred and the fallen world. So in, in popular culture now, the, the cherubs, as they're called now, they're typically um, depicted as these babies that, you know, the babies in cartoons with flying wings. Um, and that's fun, but it's, it's not at all accurate. And, and it's, it's kind of almost the exact opposite in this strange way, because these are kind of the, the, the soldiers that protect the throne. And in Ezekiel, he describes them as having the face of a human, the face of an ox, the face of a lion and the face of an eagle. So there are these like four faced, really terrifying monsters. And after Adam and Eve take a bite of the fruit, they are kicked out and the cherubim now guard the throne of God and they guard it with flaming swords, which is interesting because it's kind of a callback to the seraphim that to re-enter into the garden, everything that is impure has to be cut away. It's not necessarily that, you know, God doesn't want to be with you, but the profane cannot be allowed back into the garden. It's a place of perfection. So these, these beings are put at the gates and they say, you can no longer get back in. It's, it's not just a matter of, of them being kicked out is that it has to be protected now that these cherubim are tasked with protecting the throne of God to making sure nothing impure can get in. So with the cherubim, you kind of get your first taste that these angels are a little odd. And it's kind of a callback to why the angel told Mary that she should not be afraid. They are not like us. They, they share qualities with us, but they are strange and they're scary. And you got to have this, this being with four different faces. But th the next set of angels are the most strange set of angels. And it's these angels called the throne angels that were seen by Ezekiel. As the prophet Ezekiel stood by the river Chebar, the heavens opened before him, revealing a vision unlike any other. 
Suddenly, a chariot of divine brilliance appeared, its radiance overwhelming. At its base were wheels, shimmering like topaz, turning with a complexity beyond human comprehension. These were no ordinary wheels. They were alive, moving with an intelligence that defied logic. Covered in countless eyes, they watched in every direction, seeing all, knowing all, and turning wherever the divine will commanded without the need to change course. These were the Ophanim, the awe-inspiring beings who guarded the very throne of God. So the technical name for these angels is the Ophanim. I may not be pronouncing that right, but they are typically described as wheel angels or throne angels. And so Ezekiel has this strange vision where he sees the chariot throne of God, and then he describes it as wheels within wheels, and they have these topaz pieces, these red pieces and gold, and all these interesting little description tidbits that he kind of puts into this narrative. But what's weird about these things is it's not it's not exactly a wheel. It's a, it's a wheel in the sense that it's a circle, but it's these circles made completely of eyes. And it says in the middle of it, there's a, a an angel type thing. And on its wings, its wings are covered in, in eyes and its bodies are covered in eyes. And it's this kind of strange throne that, that God can can be a part of in some way. But it's um, a physical representation of the omnipresence of God. It, it is, it's described as it can move in any direction without um, moving. It can, you know, can change directions, and it's moving in all directions at the same time, and it can see everything at the same time. And it's this kind of physical understanding of God's presence and power in our life. But beyond it being just a symbol, it, it appears that it's an actually real type of angel, which is just bizarre. But that's how Ezekiel describes it. And, and he also goes on to describe the seraphim and these other angels. But it's this this weird angel that is kind of both a symbol and a real thing that is representative of God's um, plan for us and also his power over us, which is scary. It, it, and, it, and I think that's a good thing. It's not necessarily scary in a bad way, but it's a reminder. It's this physical reminder of, of the, our relationship with God, that he is this very powerful thing and he, and he loves us, but it's this, this odd um, physical representation of how much authority he has over us. The, the other thing that, that you'll probably heard online, um, Joe Rogan talks about it a lot. Pull up Ezekiel's description of what he saw. This is one of the favorite descriptions from the Bible from the Old Testament about UFOs that people love to to bring up because Ezekiel has this thing that he describes and it's it's the most bizarre depiction is that when people talk about the visions of Ezekiel and it being kind of an ancient understanding of uh, a UFO that Ezekiel saw the UFO. This is typically what he's talking about is this specifically the verses around the wheel angels because the understanding would be look at these weird things flying in the sky. We don't have any understanding of these discs in the sky and they have to you know gems like topaz and so we red lights or whatever. Um, that's probably a, a video for another time. I have some thoughts on it. I actually don't think it's accurate, but this is the angel, the orphanum, is the angel that they're talking about when you typically see people talking about the the UFO experience of Ezekiel and UFOs are in the Bible. Uh, it's not accurate, but it's it's an interesting idea, and that's how they kind of make that connection. And then the the final set of angels that I want to go more deeply into is the angels that everybody is familiar with this the malak or the malakim it's the the messenger angels it's the archangels this would be the angels that you have heard about in the bible as abraham sat at the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day three travelers appeared on the horizon abraham ever the gracious host hurried to offer them water and food unaware that these were no ordinary visitors. As they dined, the true nature of these travelers was revealed. They were messengers of God, 
bringing news that would change his life forever, the promise of a son, despite Sarah's old age. Centuries later, a young girl named Mary was visited by a figure far more imposing, his presence so overwhelming that his first words were a gentle command, do not be afraid. He delivered a message that would alter the course of history. She would bear a son, and his name would be Jesus. So these two stories kind of illustrate something interesting about the Malachim, the messengers, is that they seem to have some sort of um, ability to appear differently to different people. So you have Abraham on the one hand, who meets a few angels, and he he doesn't even recognize them um, at first. And then you have Mary's experience um, of the angel having to tell her, do not be afraid. So there's there's obviously a, a, a difference and a distinction between these two encounters, but from what we can tell that they are actually the same type of angel. And I think that kind of speaks to their roles, both as messengers and their role as the type of angel who would interact with us. That's their primary goal is to, they intervene much more directly in the lives of day-to-day people in their role guiding everyday people. So they have a few different kinds of jobs. So they will deliver message, um, they will guide us, and then they will also protect us, which we can link directly to scripture. They have all these different kinds of things that they're responsible for within the role of the Malachim or the Malak. So their role as messengers would be, it would be most familiar to you in terms of their talking to Mary directly to announce the birth of Jesus, but also famously, they were at the tomb of Jesus when Mary Magdalene went to look at the body and there was an angel there waiting for. So they have this kind of, this role as not just messengers, but they're guiding us. They're, they're telling us not to worry. They're, they're, they're helping guide our lives. They're interacting with us directly. And sometimes they'll hide their identity. And then other times they, they choose to not, or, or maybe that's a different uh, appearance than, than they are typically, who knows, but they have this kind of flex ability to, perform the necessary deeds in terms of, do they want to remain concealed until it's a a time appropriate to reveal themselves? Or maybe they, they want to show their divine nature and they have to tell these people, do not be afraid. Um, It's a really kind of interesting paradox, but that's just one role of the Malak. The other role of the Malak would be the role of protector, of um, ground soldier, if you will. So, Going back as early as Enoch, we see the the Malak or the Malakim not just giving messages, but also taking taking the orders of God and um, administering his divine punishment. So he in the story of Enoch, he chains these uh, these these watchers, the uh, Azazel, and um, there's a there's a few other ones named. They chain them to the center of the earth. But you can also see it in the Bible. You see it in Samuel. You see it in Psalms. Um, it is the they are um, the the angels who actually do the battling with demons. Most famously um, would be Michael, the archangel. Everybody's familiar with that. But the other angels that that fall into this category are the angels that you know. You have Gabriel who talked to Mary. You have Uriel if you're in the Catholic or Orthodox tradition. Um, these are the angels that you know by name, um, their specific name in the same way that God's name is Yahweh. We know these angels name. So they, they have told their names to us, which is really fascinating that, that they're, they're just so similar to us in, in in a lot of ways. Um, and then they're very different in other ways, but they are extremely similar to us. Um, that they would have names is odd when, you know, we, we take it for granted that, You know, these things kind of become old hat where we've heard them a thousand times, but it's just, it's just a bizarre thing to think about that there's these kind of invisible creatures that are, um, the hands of God here on earth and they have names and we know about them and we have records of them talking to people. It's just very, very odd. So one of the things that's often misunderstood about Catholic and Orthodox faith um, is the the venerations of, of saints. And this actually, strangely, hooks into our understanding of angels. And it's the understanding of the celestial hierarchy to be more specific. So 
Going back to our original understanding, you have the sons of God um, who were mentioned in Genesis 6 and other places in the Bible. And it's a confusing term that they're called the sons of God because our understanding is Jesus is the son of God. And that's true. But what's interesting about Jesus being the son of God is the only begotten son. He is the word made flesh. It's, it's a distinct, he, he has a different essence to him. He is the covenant son because he is made of the things of God. He's not just a creation of God. He's made of the same things. It's, it's, it's his essence, but it's also that he becomes physical flesh. He's fully man, f fully divine. So it's a change in the understanding and distinction of, of him as the son of God. It's a different type of thing. And he's, he's the covenant son. And that's important because the Elohim, as we discussed at the beginning, are only divine beings. They are purely spirit. That, that's the, the realm that they operate and they, they remain fully spirit. Even if we can interact with them physically, they seem to be fully spirit. And this is important because we are not fully spirit. We have a spirit, but we're also physical. And so the angels comes into play. Um, let me get the verse here. The verse is, okay. So the verse comes from verse Corinthians and it says, do you know that we will judge angels? And it's Paul talking about, um, the lives of the saints that we will have the ability to judge angels. Um, and it's not necessarily that we are above them in terms of their worth, but it is a distinction that speaks to our differences from them, that we are both flesh and spirit. So going back to the idea of the seraphim, the seraphim sit at the throne of God and you know that the six wings and they're covering the wings on their face. There's this idea that from Paul that the people who, who truly live a life on earth and they can they can shun the temptations and evils of this world and they, they can live in a way that is um, close to God's design and get God's will. But these people will be brought into heaven and it talks that we will rule over the angels. So it's placing the saints in the hierarchy um, above the seraphim, not necessarily in worth, but in the idea that that's how close they can get to God because they have transcended both the flesh and now they're fully spirit. But where the seraphim cover their face and they, they keep their gaze on God, they can't look away from God. The saints actually have the ability to sit in that hierarchy that like Paul says, and they can talk to God. They're close enough to talk to him and they worship him. But because of their, their previous nature as flesh and blood, they can actually turn back and they can, they can listen to the prayers of people on here on earth. And the same would be true of Mary, who was um, in the Catholic understanding and assumed into heaven. But that's where that understanding comes from. It's, it's actually, so it's like this weird thing that a lot of Christians don't understand but it's an understanding of um, a deep understanding of the celestial hierarchy and Paul's words that kind of puts them in heaven where they can turn back and listen to prayers. And you're not praying to them, but you're, they hear you and, and, and they want you to, to follow the will of God in the same way as evidenced by their place in the hierarchy. And I think there's also this thing in church that people misunderstand. There's, you know, you hear, sermons about how you, every, everybody's the same in heaven and that's true everybody's the same in worth but it is similar to the army it's there's a there's the authority of different roles it kind of falls down in terms of of your responsibilities because it's it's a kingdom based off of service so if you're in total love and devotion and service the idea of falling under an authority, it's its not a problem. It's the same way that children fall under the authority of the parents. And it's because of the love that is shared between the parent and child. And the same thing would be true of God's kingdom is that it's a hierarchy. It's its in a way a monarchy, you know, with the Trinity sitting at the top. It's an interesting understanding. And I think whether or not you agree with it, I think it's interesting to understand that that's where that idea that the saints or Mary could or should be venerated because that they sit so close to the throne, but they, unlike the seraphim, they can't turn to listen, that they have the ability both to look to God and speak to him, but also to to hear us. It's just an interesting idea. I thought it was kind of an interesting tidbit to kind of hook back into the celestial hierarchy. The last thing that I wanted to talk about is, I'm sure why most of you watched this video, 
Um, but it is a part of the our understanding of angels would be the Satan, demons, and also the Nephilim, which were mentioned in Genesis chapter 6. Before the fall of man, there existed a being of unmatched brilliance among the heavenly hosts. Known as Lucifer, the light bearer, admired by all the angels. Yet within his heart, a seed of pride and ambition began to grow. Desiring to ascend to the throne of God, Lucifer led a rebellion in the heavens. His followers were many, a third of the stars, but the rebellion was quashed. And Lucifer, now known as Satan, was cast out of heaven, along with his legion of fallen angels. This ancient rebellion set the stage for a cosmic struggle that continues to this day. So just a, a fun little interesting um, factoid. So I mentioned the name Lucifer in that story. Um, and Lucifer is actually kind of a, a misnomer in a way. So when St. Jerome is translating the Hebrew Bible into Latin for the Catholic Church, he is looking for a word to describe um, Venus falling out of the sky. So he's looking at, it's in Isaiah. And Isaiah is doing a metaphor where he says, the planet Venus is falling out of the sky um, like lightning. And it's a metaphor to describe the king of Babylon who is falling. But he pulls from the Hebrew the word Hillel, which is star, shining star, morning star. And he, the Latin word is Lucifer. So Lucifer then gets picked up by the New King James Bible um, accurately. But then it gets popularized in the Middle Ages by uh, John Milton's Paradise Lost, where he names Satan Lucifer. So Lucifer is technically not his name. It actually turns out to be okay because it kind of gives us a name for Satan, which is useful. But it is actually just a word that means shining star, and it's talking specifically as in this metaphor in Isaiah. But fun little interesting tidbit. So going back to the beginning of the story, we had um, the mention of the Nephilim in Genesis 6. There's these giants that walk the earth, which is part of the reason that they flood the earth. There's all kinds of interesting tidbits. That's why they have the genealogy of Noah. And it's to prove that Noah is human because these things were outside of God's design. These angels had had sex with women. They birthed these Nephilim. There's these huge, evil, red-headed giants. And... According to the Book of Enoch, and this is not biblical, but it, it is held by some percentage of Christians. And, and I should also mention that Enoch, while extra biblical, it is in the Bible for the Ethiopians, and it's referenced all over the place. In the Bible, in my opinion, it should be canonical, but to be accurate, it is not. It's not technically in canon. So the the understanding that comes from the Book of Enoch is that the one of the first instances of demons is after God floods the earth. Because these Nephilim are outside of God's plan, they are not um, within the purview of his plan for the world. That because they are neither human nor spirit, they're kind of a secret third thing. That their spirits, their souls are actually the ones that are wandering the earth that are doomed to haunt us as demons. So that's one of the first instances that we have of demons kind of coming into play that will haunt us later. The other um, understanding of demons comes from Satan himself, Lucifer. You have Satan leading a rebellion from heaven with a third of the angels. God wins the battle, and these fallen angels then um, become the demons that Jesus is casting out, um, present throughout the Bible. And there's always this question of, was the serpent in the Genesis story Satan himself? It seems that it probably was only because John in the book of Revelations refers to the final battle with the serpent, but he calls him that ancient serpent. So it seems to John that it's a call back to the guy who is in the story of Genesis, who in tricks Eve and, you know, the fruit and all of that. But it, it seems to be that that is the through line between the Genesis Satan and the Satan that, that we are familiar with in the story of Jesus and kind of God's chief adversary. But what's interesting is, so you have these kind of disparate, there's, there's two different falls. So you have the fall of the Watchers, and then you have the fall of Satan and the Nephilim. And these these things, these 
two things in the, the Nephilim become the the demons that um, that we hear about in the Bible, but also um, exorcisms of any type or you know the the bad malevolent forces here on earth. They all kind of come from from one of those three sources, which is um, really interesting. But it's important to remember that, you know, we think about these things as um, demons in their own category, but these were fallen Elohim. These were fallen soldiers for God, which is a, a very sad story. Um, it's this, this kind of heartbreaking thing that this thing, these, these divine spirits that he created ended up betraying him um, so much so that they are in eternal darkness because of it. And it's just a, a very um, heartbreaking story. I think the reason that I, I wanted to make this video is a lot of the, the odd things that, that we read in the Bible, we just kind of skip over, but, but more than it just being like a fun thing to research, I actually think, that it, it's like the Rosetta Stone that I was mentioning in the beginning. It kind of unlocks it where you start to see kind of the, the overarching themes that kind of are tangled into the Bible. When you read the Bible straight through, it's, it's very easy to, to just kind of ignore the weird stuff. But then the other piece that people forget is that the writers of the Bible were very familiar with these stories. So in Genesis 6, it's like two sentences. And they assume that you already have this understanding of what they had known growing up. They, you know, they're, they're of Jewish tradition, so they would have known Enoch. Um, and this is just one little thing. The Bible is full of these kind of like, oh, they said one word or one sentence, and then it's actually a reference to this other thing. And it's this kind of unlocking, it's like a rusting, Russian nesting doll of, of things that we, that we kind of take for granted that are already packed into the Bible. And I hope that going through this story was, was not only interesting and informative, but whether or not you believe it, I, I tend to, I, I do believe it. I do believe that is true as, as odd as it is, but but once you get into the details of this thing, it, it gets weird, but it, it's also pretty logical when you, when you start with the, the foundational understanding of um, Jesus' life and resurrection. There's, there's all kinds of um, biblical and non-biblical reasons to believe that, which I'll eventually get around to making. But I'm hoping that this gives you an understanding of not only um, the Christian faith, but also this this book that changed the course of history. It's um it's a book that you know you're talking about like impact on the world. We we literally changed the way that we measure time because of the life of one man, and he splits time in half. It's before he lived and after he uh, rose from the from the dead, and that's fascinating. And I think that just from a, a I don't know a Western civ philosophy point of view that it would be worthwhile for everybody to know about these stories um, and that's what I hope to do with this channel I want to make more of content like this obviously I'll be making a lot of religious content that's kind of my interest but I also hope to kind of shed light on the the different aspects of life that are ignored or maybe even um, shrouded, right? So there's all there's all kinds of different narratives going on and all these different um, people that want to keep us from living a life that is worthwhile um, and purposeful. And there's structures being designed through technology or government or whatever it may be that actually are in place to keep us from, from, from doing that. And that's what I have to do with this channel. Um, I have refrained from asking for the subscription at the beginning of this because I hate that. But I do want to ask you that if you like this video, please subscribe. But more than that, hit the, the, the notification bell because the way this YouTube is changing is that it is, it, having a lot of subscribers does not mean what it used to. It just means that I get another number. But what I really need is for you guys to go watch the videos. Not just because I, I, I want this to work, but, but also because if I'm not beholden to the algorithm, I can cover stuff that you may not know to search for. If I have to play to the algorithm, I have to play 
two listeners or, or two viewers that are looking for a thing. I have to ride the waves. But if you guys can subscribe and hit the bell so you get notified, I can be free to cover all kinds of different, weird, interesting stuff that you may not even be familiar with. And that's really what I hope. I hope that I can do that and I can build an audience that's really engaged. Um, if you like this, subscribe. Um, I have an email newsletter that I will link in um, the details of this video. But I hope that you guys like this because I like making these and I would like to do it more.